So welcome everybody to the Yorkshire Philosophical Society. We're really delighted this evening because for the first time that I know of, we've actually got um, a university lecturer who, when they first did their undergraduate degree a while ago, uh, was one of our award winners in York, in the archaeology department at York. Um, so Ben was the winner um, in his under third, under third year for his dissertation was the winner of the Charles Well Beloved Award. So we're really grateful for that. And he went on to do an MA and then a PhD um, with Nicky Milner as his um, supervisor. And I think he worked on Star Car and then he worked for the Newcastle University. I'm sure he's gonna tell you things about that that connect with his work now. But he's speaking to us from the University of the Highlands and Islands and from Orkney itself. So welcome, Ben. Thank you very much, Catherine. That's a, yeah, a very warm welcome, and it's an absolute delight to be um, speaking to the YPS tonight. Um, yeah, the, receiving the Charles uh, Well Beloved Award was a kind of uh, the start of my, well, I didn't know at the time, but uh, an academic career, really, um, and it gave me a huge amount of confidence and, and was a great sort of stepping stone for going on to, to study at master's level and then eventually PhD. So um, it's really great to be to be speaking to you today. It's a real a real honour to, to, that you reached out and, and invited me to, to talk as a guest lecturer. I'm really sorry that I couldn't be in York in person, um, it's just a little bit logistically tricky for me to get down from Orkney um, for a for a one night for a, for a lecture that's just kind of one, one one evening. I was hoping to try and see if I could engineer a few other bits and pieces of work that would um, that would allow me to justify it. But um, but yeah, it was a bit of a way to come. So I'm um, joining you via the wonders of Zoom. And as uh, as Catherine said, uh, we're, we're we're sort of at the mercy of the of the under undersea cabling that connects the internet for um, Orkney to mainland Scotland, which has taken a bit of a batter in the last few weeks with the storms. So um, you might just have to uh, plead to your pati patience if the if the connection does start to drop in and out. Touchwood, it's been quite good today, so hopefully it'll, it'll, be, it'll be all right. Um, but yes, as Catherine says, um, I'm now a lecturer in archaeology at the University of the Highlands and Islands, based up here in Orkney College um, in Kirkwall. Um, and but what I'm going to be talking to you about today is sort of builds on a project that was um, that really originated um, through the work that I was undertaking at, at Starcar, um, when I was working for the University of York, but in a big, big project that was in partnership with lots of different other, other institutions, including Chester, uh, Manchester, Newcastle. Um, and from that, uh, a, a project developed between myself and one of the site directors at, Sh at Starcar, Chantal Canella, um, which was examining the occurrence of, of masks in early prehistory. Um, and so uh, I'm using the uh, UHI, UHI um, the university I work for, they've got this um, new marketing scheme uh, where they're, they're very insistent that anyone who's speaking externally um, uses the branded uh, UHI PowerPoint design. So uh, you'll be under no um, confusion as to who I work for throughout this presentation. But I just want to stress at the, at the start that this is this is work that has drawn from the support of lots of different other institutions. And although the, um, the slides might sort of scream UHI at you throughout the, the course of the next hour um it's actually a, the, the result of um a, a series of really sort of long-standing partnerships between um researchers who are based at um, institutions all over the uk and indeed the world so um so yes yeah, emphasize the collaborative nature of the the, the project um that i'm going to be talking about today um, and also the, my work generally really because i think that's quite important so I'm going to be talking about a project named um, Unmasking Masks, which was a, a Leverhulme um, research funded project uh, led by Chantal Canella um, at the University of Newcastle, which started in um, 2019 and was due to run to 2021. Um, you'll notice those dates um, straddle a few quite uh, seismic world events, um, which meant that the project was um, slightly more complicated logistically than we originally anticipated. Um, and so the timing of the project has kind of spilled on beyond 2021. Um, and there are still aspects of it that are being written up at the moment. And it's not quite come to its its full fruition, which will be a book that's been published. But I've been speaking about this project for um, a number of years now, um, kind of promoting the work we've been doing and, and kind of disseminating the, res the preliminary results. Um, but I wanted to move things along a little bit um, with this presentation, with this lecture tonight. Um, so there might be aspects of what I'm going to be talking about um, this evening that, that might not have featured in, in some of the um, previous talks that I've given on this particular subject. Um, so you're like, you are awake. 
All right, so for the structure um, today, I'm going to try something a little bit more ambitious conceptually than I, than I normally do when I'm talking about unmasking masks. Um, and I uh, will be delving in a little into a little more detail on the kind of theory of material ontologies um, and why I think that's a good approach to be taking when we're studying um, masks in early and masking practices in early prehistory. Um, but to do that, I'll need to draw a little bit from the anthropology. So I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, but I thought that, you know, it's slightly more ambitious, perhaps uh, at a conceptual level, um, but you are the Philosophical Society, so I shouldn't be um, too embarrassed or ashamed to talk to you about um, theory uh, in, in this kind of context, so uh, we'll see how we get on with this. Um, but in terms of structure, uh, I'm going to start off by talking about um, masks as we see them within the archaeological record for early European prehistory, so what evidence do we have for masks and masking within the Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic of Northern Europe. I'll review the evidence as it stands, the kinds of things that people have been suggested um, to be representative of masks. Um, I'll then move on to talk about the anthropology of masks, so the ways in which anthropologists working with contemporary societies um, have studied, recorded and interpreted and analysed um, the occurrence of masks in a whole range of different societies. Um, and in doing that, I should really kind of hopefully illustrate to you the challenge that studying masks in early prehistory really, really presents, because um, I'll give you a slight spoiler now. Um, it's really, really eclectic. So masks are incredibly dynamic, dynamic, incredibly diverse. They can perform a whole host of different functions in different social and cultural contexts. Um, and so pinning down kind of um, concrete definitions of what masks are and what masks do is really, really slippery. Um, so that's the challenge that kind of emerges from a kind of review of the anthropology of masks. But then I want to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about the, the kind of the opportunities that masks also present as well and there, the way in which they hinge on um, ontologies and underlying ontologies within the societies that they operate, um, and also the ways in which archaeology and archaeologists, um, as studies of the material record, um, have a kind of a, a, an advantage or a head start or a, a propensity to maybe think about material ontologies um, with the material that we study. And then this creates an opportunity really for, for both kind of thinking about material ontologies in, in different ways, um, but also trying to start starting to unpick um, the underlying ontologies um, which might have uh, which might have which might which, which, on, on which kind of early early prehistoric societies were, were, were based. And finally, I'm going to move through for a case study uh, of the approach that we sort of developed through the project um, to think about animal masks um, and, and the modification of animal skulls in the Mesolithic, um, starting with Starkar and moving on to some other examples, just to give you a demonstration of how this approach um, might work in practice. OK, then, so I'll start off with um, a brief kind of review of uh, the kind of the, the occurrence of masks in the archaeological record for early prehistory. So it's really, really fascinating. One of the kind of the, the origin points of this project was um, Chantel kind of noticing that the that, that that when you start to see evidence for Homo sapiens sapiens um, appearing in Europe, alongside a whole host of other um, behaviours that appear, start to appear for the first time or in new forms um, within the Euro Europe's archaeological record, um, we also start to see the occurrence of what have been interpreted in the past as masks, okay? So humanoid figures, depictions of humanoids um, who have... Um, heads or faces which differ to what you might expect from a kind of um, a human body. Um, so we see this in cave art, so the, the, the kind of famous Italian site of um, the Grotto di Fiumare, um, a really interesting site that's got kind of um, middle Paleolithic occupation and then an upper Paleolithic layers associated with kind of simple stylized cave art. Um, and um, this, this particular instance, you can see the illustration here uh, that has this kind of um, triangular kind of horned head on a sort of stick man body. Um, it's been sometimes been termed a shaman, but as we'll talk about a little bit later on, that's probably the, the consequence of the ways in which um, archaeologists have tended to think about masks and masking practices. Um, rather than anything particularly um, shamanistic about its, its, its appearance per se. Um, we also have the lion mensch, the famous, famous lion mensch of the Swabian Alb. So these are figurines, um, primarily made from, I think it was exclusively made from uh, mammoth ivory, um, which feature the body of a human, um, so often the body of a human man, and the head of a lion. Okay, And there's been some debate and some discourse about what these represent, um, and some of the earlier interpretations um, suggested that these are humans wearing lion masks that they are masked and that there's been kind of all sorts of discussions about the detail on the back of the lion mentions his head um as to whether there's uh kind of evidence of clasping or binding that might be attaching this mask to the to the face of a human um, whose body is is sort of displayed 
Um, and then uh, finally, the the, the Hohenfels figurine um, is also another example of, of what's been kind of mooted for mass. So this is a, a, a figurine, a female figurine, again, made from ivory. Um, and you can see that it's uh, she's, she's missing a head. Um, so she's got this kind of loop at the top on top of her shoulders. Um, and there's been all sorts of work that's been kind of carried out on that. Is that is that for attaching um, a different kind of opposable heads? Uh, can you kind of uh, different materials that might be used to create a composite artifact um, that depicts her head? Um, and there's been work undertaken more recently by Stanard and Langley, uh, looking at the potential materials that might be involved in that and trying to work out best a best case scenario or most likely a likely candidate for what that head might have been made from and, and what it might have been attached with. But it's interesting to note that the the body itself, um, there seems to be something going on in terms of what why you might need um, an interchangeable head. Is that representative of of, um, of changing of masks or different modifying different um, depictions of the face uh, within the the organization? So, just again stressing that this is um, evidence that stretches right way back to the earliest appearance of our species in Europe. Um, as soon as Homo sapiens sapiens arrive on the scene in Europe. Um, there's a discussion starting as to whether or not they're wearing masks based on a variety of different strands of evidence. As we move forward into the middle of Paleolithic, um, the GB, the GPWKA, so this collection of different um, cultures um, which kind of follow the organization after a, a kind of cold snap in Europe um, and have previously been thought to be distinct, but now the kind of Consensus sort of driven by Paul Pettit is, is, is moving towards considering these, these different groups uh, of people as maybe as a kind of cohesive whole because they share um, a lot of a lot of kind of cultural factors in common. Um, so this is the Gravettian, the Pavlovian, the Willendorf, uh, the Kostenkian, the Lido complexes, um, which is spread right across um, Western and Eastern and Northern and Southern Europe. Um, again, depictions of faces and masks crop up in the interpretation of archaeologists within these contexts as well. Um, so we've got some of these really kind of uh, the, the occurrence of human and particularly female figurines um, in these different cultures is really well documented. Um, and it's really, really uh, striking that so many of these figurines don't feature any facial detail. So they'll have incredible levels of um, anatomical detail um, on the genitals on secondary sexual characteristics on the hair. Um, uh, but very, very little in the way of facial detail depicted um, on the intact figurines. Now, that situation changes slightly when we find um, detached heads of figurines, okay? So there are certain um, pieces of figurines, fragments of figurines, which have a high level of detail. Um, uh, down the Basson Prix, we can see here, it's an example, beautiful example from France, Gravettian um, um, uh, figurine head, uh, where she does have the nostrils and the eyes um, depicted, and she's got a lot of detail in terms of her hair, or is it headgear that's, that, that's on top of her head? Um, but she's missing a few details in terms of her mouth, and she's only got one eye that's been inside. Um, so there's question marks that have been raised as to what that signifies in terms of depicting some facial details but not others. Are these being covered? Are these masks in some in some way, shape, or form? And then we get other examples of um, completely detailed um, human heads, but these are really re they're, ne they're, they're never in terms of total detail um, attached to or intact in terms of the re remainder of the humanoid figurine. When we do get in intact humanoid figurines, it's very, very, very rare that there's any sort of suggestion of facial detail whatsoever, um, to the point where it starts to become kind of they're conspicuous in their absence, the lack of faces. Um, and that's attracted attention, you know, are these depicting masked faces? Or why is there some kind of, why does there seem to be um, such rules about depicting any level of facial detail on these on these figurines where other parts of the body are, body are, are, are kind of depicted in really kind of high levels of fine detail. What's that about? What's that telling us in terms of people's attitudes to faces? Are these are these figurines wearing masks um, or have they been made to, to allow detail to be added and removed from the face um, as a mask would? Um, and then we also in the in the uh, GPWKA um, start to see evidence of what uh, Margaret Musi has, has suggested a masked burial. So these are uh, we start to see human burials within the archaeological record. Um, and when we do, we often see material endowment and embellishment focused around the head and the face. OK, so the placing of ochre around the head or across the face red ochre in grave deposits um, and the placing of um, beads in particular. So what look like might be appliques or, or, or forms of adornment that are focused around the head and the face. Um, and that's the kind of led to the suggestion or the interpretation of practices of death masking in the uh, G GPWKA um, at this particular point in the Upper Paleolithic. 
Moving forward, when we start to get into the Magdalenian, so this is kind of following the course, but sort of classic sequence for um, for kind of uh, Europe, Northern European um, um, cultural groups in, in, in the Upper Paleolithic, the sort of Orignatian, um, Gretian, uh, Magdalenian. But as we move into, into the, uh, the Magdalenian, uh, we start to see um, different attitudes towards the face in terms of um, the ways in which humans and human forms are depicted in um, Parata or the mobility art, particularly in southern France. Um, and we see uh, the occurrence of, of, of quite, quite numerous um, human and animal composite um, depictions, okay? So depictions of humanoid forms um, with animal features, similar to, to those kind of learn mentions that we were seeing um, earlier on in the Arab nation, but a, a much later date. Um, and these come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So in terms of cave art, um, we see the famous um, uh, sorcerer of Letre Frere, uh, this individual, and we've got a picture of him coming up later on, um, with the kind of the, the antlers of a, of a deer, the, the legs of a human, the, the, the eyes of an owl, um, really kind of um, classic example of, of, a, of a kind of a, a human animal um, sort of composite made up of not just a blend of one human and one animal, but lots of different things. That's been interpreted interpreted as a as a masked individ individual. Uh, but you also get even in the same cave other examples of the Petit Sorcier, um, the Sorcier from Gabilou, um, and then other cave systems which have, have produced similar, um, similarly ambiguous, uh, ambiguous humanoid features, uh, humanoid depictions that have got the heads of, of animals. Um, it tends to it tends to kind of bias in this towards animals with antlers and horns because they're often easier to spot and identify. Um, and also there's a bias there in terms of uh, the depiction of male individuals because um, male genitalia uh, tend to be when they're depicted kind of more sort of distinguishing but when, 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 it, when it comes to yeah, composite beings that might have different parts of different animals to represent different bodies. Um, but we do see away from the cave art, uh, kind of incised onto pedals or, or gallons, um, sites like Etoile, um, other forms of, of kind of humanoid depicted. Um, and we've got uh, this individual here that seems to have a, a horse's head and then um, a woman's body in terms of the breasts um, and the genitals represented there, you can see. Um, and then this other individual that's got the kind of the, the turned head um, and you can see her breast and her, and her, her left shoulder. Um, again, looking like a, an animal head on a, on, a, on a female human body. And then that example just above um, that is from Isteritz, this really, really famous example. It's a, it's a piece of, I think it's bison rib um, that has uh, on the one side these two forms of, you've got, you've got two bison chasing each other. And on the other side, um, it's got this kind of strange sort of pair of, of human animal composites. Um, so the, the one on the left hand side that you can see there, um, it's got these kind of bindings around uh, the sort of the wrists uh, and around the neck. And then it's got a really kind of sort of lionish sort of head, you know, it's kind of depicted in a kind of lionish manner. Um, and then the individual in front um, looks much more kind of animally in terms of the haunches, but then sort of has a kind of a sort of a human thigh, um, but then really an obviously an animal, an animal kind of um, knee joint. Uh, but you can see again, they've got those kind of that, those sort of linear bindings around the joint. Um, and they've actually got that kind of Christmas tree shape. You can see, can you see my cursor just just there um, on the opposite side of this artifact there's bison that are being hunted um, and these forms are really similar to some of the biserial bar points projectile points that we find made of bone antler um, at sites like Istrits. Um, but yeah so this looks kind of animally um, but it's got the kind of human breast under the under the elbow under the elbow under the armpit there and you can see evidence of another of those kind of collars along the top so um yeah really kind of enigmatic um sort of mixture of different features being de depicted in, in in quite some detail now some of these examples um have been re-examined recently by Paul Pettit um, and, and amongst others um and are thought to maybe be evidence of depictions of bears so obviously a bear has a kind of vaguely humanoid um sort of form in terms of maybe being bipedal in the shape of the body um especially when it's being depicted in this kind of style um and some of those uh kind of sort of slightly more ambiguous humanoid forms that have the kind of elongated faces um, uh, uh, have been kind of reinterpreted as bears. You can see one along the, along the side here um, more recently. Um, but it still leaves quite a few of these depictions um, which, which do seem to combine um, other, other forms of animal um, with humanoid traits uh, in, in some detail. And then we've got this fantastic um, example here at the top from um, Tolentino, uh, which, is a, which is an incised um, piece of shale, so a plaquette, a Magdalenian plaquette, um, that does seem to show a um, humanoid face with an eye and a nose, and then something being attached to the, to the front of the face. 
Um, so it seems to have this kind of material adornment or embellishment, which is looking like a, looking like a mask. Um, and if you start to look at the profile of the face, it kind of deteriorates, you know, very clearly um, human back of the head and neck and shoulder. And as you move down the front of the face, it starts to get a bit more ambiguous in terms of what we're looking at there, um, whether that's a mouth or a nose or a beak. Um, quite what's going on is a bit is a bit is a bit difficult to understand and, and perhaps that's deliberate. And then as we move forward into the Mesolithic period, so out of the, the Pleistocene and into the Holocene, the evidence for masks um, come in a range of different forms or, or, or things that have been mooted to be masks. So we have this kind of tradition of the, the production of modified um, red deer crania, uh, which we see so clearly expressed at Starkar, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but it's actually a phenomenon that's represented across kind of um, northern Germany as well. Um, so we see red deer skulls being modified um, into what we think are, are kind of headgear, and we can maybe think of those as, as a mask from an anthropological sense. Um, uh, and that being kind of phenomena that's associated with the, the early Mesolithic in particular. Um, we also get this kind of uh, the kind of a, a, a re-emergence of this um, habit of, of, of embellishing the face in, in burials and in death, um, covering the face or attaching pieces of material culture across the head and the face um, to create things that might look like masks. So um, this kind of stringing of animal um, tooth beads um, around the kind of the circumference of the head, something for me to, you know, akin to a ferronier in terms of a piece of jewellery. Uh, that runs the circumference of the skull. Uh, and then we also see the emergence of, or the re-emergence of practices um, associated with the use of minerals, so clay and ochre, um, to kind of coat or to plaster the face of the deceased in burials. Um, again, the kind of sites like Zvenyeki are really kind of clear examples of this, but actually it's a Tagarup is another really nice example of a, a Mesolithic burial where the, 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 the face is absolutely plastered with, with, with red ochre. Um, and again, it's kind of the idea of a, of a death mask, of, 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 a, of a kind of mask that's uh, applied to the deceased in, in burial. Um, so, yeah, the idea of masks being something that then kind of percolates through into the Mesolithic. Um, so, all in all, there's this kind of, as you can see, it, it's kind of ambiguous. There are, there are moments where, where the idea of masks and masking becomes perhaps clearer than other, than other moments, but there's always an element of ambiguity around um, any kind of interpretation of a mask in early prehistory. But that's not to say it's not something real, it's not something that's manifest in the material, but it's something that needs to be kind of approached critically um, and with a bit of scepticism and with a bit of kind of an eye to detail in terms of how we tease that out um, so that we're not kind of overreaching ourselves in terms of our, our interpretations. Um, so it's with that in mind that, you know, and but, but potentially this is really interesting that that masks seems to be cropping up in the in the archaeological record at the same time as our species arriving. And what is that telling us about the longevity of masking practices? Um, what does that mean to us, you know, especially in the last few years, as we've all been um, certainly in, in, in the UK have been wearing masks more regularly um, with the advent of, of the wearing of surgical masks and respirators um, in, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, this is this is this is providing kind of interesting context to, to, to thinking about the, the longevity of masking practices within kind of human cultures and human societies. Um, and what is it about masks that that that, that humans seem to kind of um, and society seem to kind of gravitate back to back to. So with that in mind, um, the kind of projects that I was involved with um, sort of turned its eye and turned its attention to the anthropology of masks and the ways in which um, contemporary societies um, uh, engage with masks and, and, and the ways in which anthropologists have documented and analysed that. Um, and it became immediately apparent that, that within anthropology, there is a really long history of research associated with masks. And actually, this probably um, this probably provides a partial explanation as to why some of the some of the suggestions of masks appear so early in the relatively early in the archaeological literature, you know, some of that kind of initial discovery of those cave art sites in southern France, um, the kind of turn of the, the, 18, the 19th century, 19th, 20th century, um, is, you know, those interpretations of those uh, depictions being masks are coming about at the same time that the anthropologists are really getting into or, or the research on the anthropology of masks is really taking off. Um, and this comes from an interesting kind of folklore, um, but also religious studies. So kind of some of the early colonial projects in terms of um, mis Christian missionaries trying to study and document um, various world religions in order to understand how they might be um, converted to Christianity most effectively um, has often led to a kind of focus on, on the role that masks play. And that means that the, the kind of masks as a kind of theme within anthropological research is sort of is almost there from day one in terms of the development of anthropology as a as a discipline and as a kind of way of doing research 
Um, but it's kind of within that context, it's kind of interesting to think about the the where our kind of understanding of masks come from, people living in, in 21st century Britain today. Um, and it's kind of within the context of anthropology, you can kind of make an argument that, that the way in which we think about masks has a kind of direct sort of historical link back to the use of um, classical masks in Greek theatre. Uh, so the idea of the tragedy and the comedy, comedic masks in, in, used in performance. Um, and all of our understandings of masks today um, that we that we kind of share, that I, that I would have shared before I started doing this reading, um, kind of hinge on ideas of deception, of concealment, um, and of suspension of disbelief, okay? So donning a mask um, to, 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 to become a character uh, and to allow an audience to think that you're this willing to suspend their dif disbelief um someone different and that's really interesting conceptually because it's kind of got this idea of of kind of truth a true self below the mask uh, and a kind of a false self which is the 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 the, the depict the where there's represented on the front of the mask that the audience sees um and so you know you get you get the kind of the emergence of, of phrases like when the mask slips you know the idea that a truth is revealed when a when a mask uh, kind of loses its orientation and you you see the the true self behind the mask um that's kind of conceptually and sort of ontologically that's kind of an interesting distinction that not all societies um draw and it's worth we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment but that's certainly the way in which um most kind of western societies would assume um that, that masks work and it also opens the door for uh, what's kind of Pisano calls the kind of the, the fundamentally horrific nature of, of masks uh, is the kind of line that, you know, when you're looking at a mask, the mask says, I am everything you see and all that you fear is behind me. So alongside that kind of level of truth and falsehood, you've also got the the, the known or the public and the, the private and the unknown behind the mask, um, which creates a, an element of tension and drama and, and, and kind of feeds into um, that those kind of that kind of original kind of emergence of uh, of, of of masks as we know them um, through Greek theatre, uh, but it's really important to stress that that is not the only way in which people around the world today and in the recent past have thought about masks. Masks can do a lot more um, than simply um, represent truth or falsehood or or, or conceal and reveal um, identities. So um, one of the kind of key ways in which other things that masks can do is their kind of way in which they're bound up into power and representation. So masks can be in themselves as objects, can be incredibly socially powerful. And the debate on representation kind of stems back to the work of, or is kind of typified or personified even by the work of um, Claude Levi Strauss uh, and his kind of seminal work on, on kind of Northwest Coast uh, American um, masking traditions in his book, The Way of the Mask. So this is often seen as a kind of a, there's such an influential anthropologist, um, this is often seen as a kind of a, a keystone text in terms of mask studies, The Way of the Masks. Um, and in that he argues that or he explores the way in which um, details and kind of binaries in terms of mass design within these societies often correspond to um, mythology um, and, and characters and, and, and kind of values expressed through mythology. Uh, so he's kind of looking at the sort of the structure behind um, those kind of underlying structures that, 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 that order both the form of masks and the, the way in which myths, myths are developed and told, it's kind of essentializing um, idea of, of kind of binary opposites. Um, and so there's been this kind of focus on the on what masks look like so the idea of what they might represent being linked to their form um so you know what is a mask what does it mean what's it what's it what's it representing um has been a kind of a long research theme for anthropologists but in more recent years there's kind of been the emergence of non-representational uh, representational approaches that focus less on what a mask um looks like um, and more what a mask actually does what's it doing socially uh, when it's being worn when it's been taken off when it's being stored um what is its kind of social function um and then uh, in the last few years there's been a kind of a, a response to that sort of binary that kind of dualism um to advocate more than representational um approaches and masks are really good for more than representational approaches. so it's the idea that you don't say it's either representational or non-representational you say it's representational plus it does other things okay so that's really useful for when we think about masks because Masks often have a meaning that stems from their form. What do they look like? What kind of materials are they using? You know, that, that, they, they kind of construct their meaning through their through their formal through their formal kind of manifestation, really. Um, but they also do stuff as well. So you know, more than representational approaches do, do kind of uh, sort of lend themselves to, to mask studies. Um, and then you can kind of see uh, it's sort of really kind of 
infamous example of the kind of impact and the, the influence that masks can have. This kind of the famous example of the, the faux of art movement, um, you know, people like Picasso and Durain, um, drawing from uh, some of the African fang masks um, and the ways in which those objects have become incredibly powerful within sort of the development of, of, of Western art, um, even if they were kind of originally perceived as a kind of um, art primitif, you know, a kind of a sort of a colonial outlook on, on the idea of primitive art forms within, within kind of African societies or world societies more generally. Um, but these are being objects which actually help to or shape um, kind of uh, art history and aesthetics within um, within Western Europe and uh, on a global scale and, and end up taking on a life of their own, being quite kind of effective in, in those sorts of contexts. Um, so another ways in which kind of themes in terms of masks from the anthropological literature that kind of emerge um, is the idea of masks both connecting and dividing different things, different people, different materials. Um, so masks are really interesting when they're worn, they form this kind of interface between um, an audience and a performer, um, between a human body and the external world. Um, they kind of bring in lots of, you know, if you've got masks that are made from composites from lots of different kinds of material um, they bring all that stuff together um, and they connect it through wearing to the human body um, and that's been kind of Personally, or really kind of typified by um, Hepatel's work on kind of Mesoamerican archaeological masks and looking at the way in which they kind of um, pull on uh, their form to, uh, and the materials that are used, as well as the people that are wearing them, to create very, very kind of specific meanings um, which go beyond what they might kind of look like at the sort of surface level. Um, and that's a really kind of interesting, you know, it's a really kind of they're, they're, they're this kind of dividing line between the, the the human body and materials, but they're also this kind of liminal zone that pulls everything together uh, and creates potentially something new. Um, and they can also do um, kind of quite interesting things at the sort of the cosmological level as well. So uh, there's the kind of Yupik sort of um, Southern Alaskan um, mask making tradition, really, really um, well documented, well studied. Um, you know, Livy Strauss was working with with Yupik mask makers at, at various points um, during kind of his field work um, but kind of more recently um, Finup Ruren has work relatively more recently um, has been looking at the way in which you pick approach masks um, and rather than seeing them as something that is kind of the creation of a performance um, the idea of looking through a mask as a wearer um, being a way of of looking through from one world into another world so masks themselves become rather than a kind of a, a, a tool of deception or deceit um, or disguise they're actually a, a lens between different cosmological worlds. So they allow the dancers to see through into the, for example, the world of the dead or the world of the spirits, um, depending on the kind of context and the and the sorts of activities that they're, the, the style of the mask and the, active, the, 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 the status of the wearer and the activities that they're being involved in. Um, so really, really kind of, you know, sort of not the way in which we might think about masks at all, but, but the potential to do all sorts of stuff um, to different groups of people around the world at different times. And then finally, um, is it finally? No, not finally. Um, moving on uh, to think about masks as you know, not tools of disguise and deception, but also but, but tools of transformation. Um, so you look at the archaic um, word for mask, which is larvae. It's got a shared Latin root for lava, both linked to the Roman laris, which is a family of domestic spirits, which comes prominence at moments of biographical um, transformation and transition. So the idea of, of masks, even within a European context, um, so my dog is woofing in her sleep so sorry if she's uh, interrupting but um yeah so these even within a European context um there are kind of these roots to linguistically the way we we think we express uh, the term mask that suggests they might be um linked to corporeal transformation okay so this is um this is the transformation of, a, of one body into another form of body all right so the kind of thing that you might think um sort of in the realms of western science is, is or western societies is is kind of physically possible is sort of farcical or fanciful fanciful um but within lots of the societies around the world um those kind of happens and you know if you think of um catholic beliefs about you know um the corporal transformation you know the body of christ the blood of christ in in terms of taking communion um the ideas of corporal transformation aren't too aren't too far away from us um within kind of um western societies in the 21st century um so it's not it's not too much of a flight fancy to think that um other people might think that that way as well and they certainly do so um 19th century british columbia um lots of mask wearing ceremonies being documented by anthropologists so the nooks the the tinglit and the 
Simitian mask wearing ceremonies. Um, and in, within these ceremonies, um, the mask really acts as a catalyst. OK, so it's the wearing of the mask that starts this transformation. Um, and it often hinges on kind of more fundamental underlying beliefs concerning what makes up a body and the idea of um, if you can change your outer surface, um, then that changes, fundamentally changes um, your body. Um, it's not just a kind of layering effect, it is, it is changing your body. And that's often incorporated into the design of masks. So you'll often get these, um, you know, there's quite a cult, uh, masks um, from, from British Columbia, which are really, really famous in terms of having these kind of outer layers that change throughout the form and sort of open up and reveal different types of self underneath the mask. Um, and reveal different people that have been transformed. And it's that changing of the outer surface, which signifies the, the, the transformation of the body um, in terms of the wearer. And it's really important to stress that this is not like a trick or a performance. Um, this is not an audience suspending, um, willingly dis suspending di disbelief as they might um, in a kind of theatrical performance of people wearing masks. Um, everyone involved in the ceremony uh, fundamentally believes that the person has changed their, transformed their body into, into a different form um, through, through wearing masks and behaving in certain ways. And then finally, that brings us to um, performance. Um, so performance in a kind of anthropological context, uh, the idea of there being, you know, you can being, um, you can be doing something. Um, and if you're showing other people that you're doing something, uh, that is uh, in some way a, a performance of some type. Um, and performances kind of, again, anthropologically are sort of actions, interactions and relationships. So they exist um, between things. And when you're performing, um, it gives you the power to create alternative realities. So illustrate to an audience or illustrate to yourself um, how the world might work slightly differently um, to the way, it, the way it did before or after the, the performance. Um, and this is kind of really interesting because it, it, it places a, an emphasis on the performers as humans, um, empowers performers to go about, you know, to explore the idea of, of different kinds of realities, different ways the world could work. Um, and it's really interesting when it comes to masks, because if we're thinking about masks as material culture, as objects, um, we can talk all, all, all day about the different forms, the different materials they use, um, the different ways in which they might um, represent or not represent um, all sorts of ideas and values and meanings and the kind of the impact they might have on people around them as objects. Um, but it's performance that allows people to have a role within that process um, and it allows people to change what might have been the otherwise uh, perceived meaning of a mask and do different things with that. And a really nice example of that is um, um, Holman's research in Burkina Faso. Um, so here looking at the Bobo um, Kimi masking tradition. So you can see on the right hand side here, it's glorious Kimi masking Kimi masks. So these are all um, kind of ar archetypal mythological figures are often quite sort of abstract, really long standing tradition of, of making these masks uh, within Bobo society really kind of revered um, and mask making is, is kind of really revered as a practice. Um, uh, but they're always kind of these sort of simple sort of archetype characters uh, that are danced at, at, at certain times of the year in certain contexts. Um, but one particular mask maker in the kind of recent past, Andre Sanu, um, really, really talented guy, started taking on commissions to um, create uh, individuals. So rather than these kind of mythological characters that were being uh, represented in the masks, um, he would take on um, the commissions to, to make kind of memorial masks for people who'd often passed away. Uh, and he'd bring together lots of different materials that are important to that person and think about their personality and representing these, these really cool masks. You can see a, an example of one on the left hand side here. That's very obvious of a specific a, a mask that represents a specific person um, and when this kind of happens there's sort of this interesting kind of response you know sort of within um kind of bobo society people saying oh you know that's, that's interesting isn't it you know it's not um you know it's not what we've done previously but uh but i guess that's kind of the way the world's going um but it was only when these masks were danced that that when these masks were were, were performed with that um that it really kind of kicked off in terms of controversy and people really sort of pushed back against the idea of 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 um of memorializing individuals um through masks um, and it became a really kind of contentious issue but it was the performance that that triggered that it wasn't the the making of the mask initially so performance is a really kind of important can be a really important factor when, we, when we're thinking about masks um, because it kind of gives individual humans the ability to affect and change what a mask might mean to different people um, and to take masks into different directions. It kind of puts puts masks in motion from, from that perspective and stops them being a, a fixed thing that has a fixed and set meaning. So to sum up, um, as you can see, <laughs> the anthropology of masks is really, really eclectic. 
Um, there is something about masks that we can see in lots of different societies that gives them huge potential to create meaning. OK, so putting materials on your face and combining different sets of materials um, in conjunction, direct conjunction with the human body, but in particular with the face and the head um, is an incredibly meaningful gesture. It seems to kind of cut through lots of different societies um, and is really, really powerful. And you can see lots of different people um, kind of riffing on the power of that and taking it in different directions in terms of mass design and, and traditions of mass wearing and mass production. Really, really interesting to note that from the anthropology, masks don't have to be worn to be powerful, okay? So they don't have to be placed on a human's face. Um, you get within, you pick societies kind of like elbow masks, knee masks. So they're things that do the job of a mask, but they're never made to be worn across the face. Uh, and you also get certainly in sort of West African societies, uh, masks that are produced never to be worn, but to be displayed. And it's about controlling a, a space within which that mask sits and that mask holds a huge amount of kind of social and cosmological power, but is, but is kind of tucked away um, and is never kind of worn by a human being. Other thing to note for an archaeological perspective, slightly more main, mundane perhaps, but the vast majority of these masks are made from organic materials and they're really, really fragile. So if we think of those Kimi masks we were talking about before, for example up here, um, all these feathers, all this cordage, all these kind of fantastic colours, textiles, really unlikely to survive within the archaeological record for long periods of time. Um, so that creates a challenge for us as archaeologists because it means that um, even if we're kind of if we suspect masks might be present within a society, we might never see them. But the key thing here to remember is um, that, or to, or to stress here, is that with all these different kind of ways in which masks can work, um, they're underpinned by the broader ontology of the society that creates those masks. Okay, so it's ontology that really kind of dictates um, what a mask is and what a mask can do within any kind of given society. So I'll just talk a little bit about ontology um, in terms of introducing it as a, as a concept. Um, I mentioned it a couple of times now, but it's worth it's worth kind of clarifying a little bit what I mean when I say on the word ontology. So ontology is the kind of the, the rules by which um, reality works, the kind of metaphysics. OK, so in terms of your experience of the world around you, um, what you expect to happen when you raise a ball in the air and drop it falls to the floor why do you think that happens um what you know what would what it would be ontologically unsettling if you if you drop that ball and it didn't fall to the floor it would be ontologically unsettling if the sun didn't rise tomorrow morning um, it'd be ontologically unsettling if um the weather system that we experienced or have you know adapted our lives to to kind of cope with began to change dramatically um these are ontologies they're they're kind of the the, the kind of the day-to-day -day, um reality of of or, or rules by which um our reality tends to work you can think about them as meta physics within western societies but the key thing about ontologies is really really key they're culturally variable okay so different people around the world today have different ontologies different sets of rules different expectations of what different materials can do um, and they're all based on experience or collective experience within a, within a culture within a society okay so if you've never seen a material do a certain thing um it will be ontologically surprising for you to see it behave in that particular way um, and that can become unsettling or challenging, or you might just never think that that thing can do that particular, behave in that particular way, do that particular thing. Um, so we know that they're culturally variable in the present, uh, and the chances are that they're culturally variable in past societies as well. Well, they are. You know, there's, no, there's, no, there's no guarantee that the, the ontologies that we build our world around um, in kind of Western Europe today um, would have been held, held true for, for, for societies in the past. Ontological values associated with um, animals and materials have been of particular interest for anthropologists. So some of the kind of big players in terms of the development of the anthropology of ontology, people like Vivarius de Castro um, has looked at uh, people's relationship to animals within what can be broadly you know, termed sort of animist ontologies. So societies where kind of um, human beings don't hold a kind of exclusive primacy, a kind of uh, uh, above other other species of animals within the world in terms of their ability to be kind of social agents to talk to do all the things that we, we might kind of um, associate with, with with human behavior uh, and also materials as well so um, societies where uh, materials are thought of in different ways materials are thought to be able to do different things uh, perform in different ways or might be grouped or categorized in in, in different kind of units um, there's kind of anthropological work that's been expended kind of uh, invested in looking at in, in looking at um material ontology as well around the world today <laughs> <laughs>
Um, but it does present some real kind of challenges uh, for, for kind of archaeologists who are looking to think um, about alternative ontologies that might have underpinned past societies, because, you know, we we're, kind of, we're faced with a very kind of real sort of challenge of how do we think beyond the rules um, of our own experience reality. If, if ontologies are kind of things that frame the way in which we see the world, how do we look beyond the way in which um, we see the world. Luckily, um, my PR in the project and co-author uh, Chantal Keller has put um, some quite quite a lot of effort into 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 thinking about this um, and uh, sort of her 2011 book uh the archaeology and archaeology of materials not prehistory of materials um is is a kind of a, a sort of a handbook really or a, or a kind of a case study as to how you can go about thinking about material ontology within early prehistoric societies um so she notes the idea when it comes to material ontologies uh, most western ontologies are based on the hylomorphic model um which is uh, kind of traces back to the classics it's this idea that um when we talk about material culture um, materials are natural um and then the forms of materials so material culture objects are cultural okay so this idea that wood is a natural material but if i make it into a spoon that's a human that's a cultural that's an anthropological um, object it's an artifact we do this all the time in our, as archaeologists you know we'll be looking for anthropologically modified material cultures objects artifacts to distinguish the presence of humans within within the kind of past at the archaeological level um but she notes that this is a really kind of it's a really interesting distinction that we, that we make between the idea of materials being natural um, and objects being cultural um but you can't assume that for past societies there are lots of societies that don't make that distinction and when you start to challenge that and break that down um it really kind of fundamentally changes the way changes the way in which people conceptualize materials which materials are similar which materials are the same um which materials are, are, are dramatically different um, and those kind of lines that we take for, for granted that we see as kind of being intuitive in terms of the way in which we look at the world around us um, can be redrawn in different societies, different different contexts, depending on people's lived experience of, 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 of those materials and those kinds of objects. Um, so how do we get to that? Uh, there's a kind of a, a focus, you know, if we're thinking about ontologies that are constructed through lived experience, um, we have to think kind of quite carefully about what is it those most materials are doing within those societies? So how do they behave? What are their kind of key properties? How are people using them? How are they experienced? How are people working with materials? Can we think you know, from a technological perspective um, about the ways in which people are engaging with materials to make different types of objects, different types of material culture? Um, and if you were to engage in those ways, um, how might you come to understand that material, what it's capable of, what it's good at, what it's not good at, um, what its kind of special skills are, what its kind of um, effects are? Um, so Chantel Canada's work sort of advocates this sort of attention to material and attention to context in terms of how people come to understand materials within the archaeological record to help us get beyond um, the hylomorphic, the Western kind of hylomorphic um, um, ontology, ontological model um, that we are all kind of predisposed towards that we would kind of, um, we, would, we wouldn't necessarily um, think to challenge unless it was kind of explicitly raised. So within the context of all this, with all this mess, with all this complication, um, we're sort of developing an approach to thinking about masks um, that can that can capture the wide range of roles that we know masks can play and the forms that they can take. Um, so the two kind of areas of practice that we've been looking at in the early prehistoric record are practices that involve dressing the head. So the material embellishment of heads, where we can see that in the archaeological record, whether that's in burials, whether that's artifacts that are designed to be worn on the head, um, whether that's kind of clear depictions in kind of cave art or, or parata art of um, or, or parata of mobility art of, of, of adornment that has been placed on and around the head. Um, and then also a twin practice or a kind of related practice of the way in which faces are depicted. So when facial details are depicted, when facial details aren't depicted, what kinds of contexts are those kind of occurring in? Are they on intact artifacts figurines? Are they on broken artifacts figurines? And where we get overlap between um, those two kind of fields of practice, where we've got evidence for the dressing of the head and the evidence of depicting faces, um, I think what we're kind of leaning towards is saying that those are kind of the kinds of context that we could say that there is kind of good evidence for um, masking practices being pre present. Um, and that kind of gives us a kind of focus to think about the broader social context um, within the within which those kind of overlapping uh, materials and practices are situated. So that's our kind of guide to, to kind of making our way through all this noise and mess and ambiguity um, to actually identifying um, where we might we might think of there being good evidence but but for masks in early prehistoric societies in Europe. So on that note, then I'll move on to talk um, a little bit about Starcar.
and a case study to think about how this, this kind of thing might work in practice. So, so Starcar, for those of you not familiar with the site, I'm sure you should have heard a little bit about it um, through the work of the YPS in the past. Um, but a site uh, just outside Scarborough in North Yorkshire, um, famously excavated, excavated by Moore and Clark in the 1940s um, and 50s, um, early Mesolithic um, settlement site on the edge of what is now uh, an extant lake. Um, so as part of uh, Graham Clark's excavations at the site, um, he recovered 21 artifacts, um, which he decided, which he interpreted as being um, red deer headdresses. OK, so these were the skulls of male red deer um, that had been uh, reduced. They had the kind of the front, the nasal bones removed. They had all the lower kind of um, the, the mandibles removed. They had the lower areas, the brain ca case um, taken away smooth surfaces created, so the internal areas of the brain case smoothed off, um, and the antlers have been lightened, so they'd often have sort of 80, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the circumference of the antlers have been removed um, through this groove and splinter technique, um, which had the effect of leaving the form of the antlers intact, um, but lightening them considered considerably. And a lot of these artifacts had also been perforated, so they had holes created through the skulls, so they had anything between one and four holes created um, and that led Clark to, to, to interpret these as, as being they've been modified with the intention of creating headgear to be worn on the head. Um, and his kind of interpretation of, of what that was for was either a hunting disguise or a ceremonial costume. OK, so we can see two examples of the kind of from the ethnographic literature um, that was Clark was kind of drawing from to illustrate this. This is an Avenki Shane on the bottom here. And you can see this individual is wearing this kind of um, animal fur coat and he's got this uh, big drum and uh, and he's got the antlers on his on his head protruding up and a nice set of um, deer ears as well. And he seemed to be an Invenki shaman. Whereas uh, at the top here, we can see a group of hunters in, in northern Florida, um, and they are wearing deer hides and deer skulls on top of their heads in order to, can you see their arms and their bows and arrows here, in order to creep up on um, wild deer herds uh, and hunt them at close range. So Clark um, sort of couldn't decide whether which one it was, but he kind of drew, suggested these two suggestions. And it's really interesting that, that, you know, the context that Clark's writing there in the 1950s, um, there's a direct relationship there between um, the, the early anthropology looking at early kind of um, religious societies and the roles that mass plays in, in, in those, their influence on cave art, interpretation of, um, where is he? Let's get back. Um, the sorcerer, you know, Adebru's interpretation of the, the sorcerer um, in terms of uh, a, a kind of a, a shapeshifter, um, a magician, um, and then that kind of bleeding into this kind of this, this suggestion that this would be a ceremonial kind of ritual costume, um, uh, something shamanistic. Um, uh, and that's, you know, you can see a kind of direct sort of uh, link there between those those kind of those schools of research that led Clark to, 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 to present these interpretations. Um, and there's been kind of talk about this being evidence for, for shamanism. Um, and but there's always kind of been this sort of the idea of this being a dichotomy. It's got to be one or the other. It's got to be a hunting, a hunting disguise, or it's got to be a um a, a kind of ritual um ceremonial costume. That's until the work of um Chantal Canella in sort of early noughties and the publication of a paper um, titled Becoming Deer, Corporal Transformations at Star Car uh, in 2005. Um so this is kind of publication published at the time that I was kind of starting my, my archaeology degree, really. Um uh, and this is kind of putting forward the idea that it doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, and there are other ways of thinking about um attitudes towards um, human and animal relationships and attitudes towards human and animal bodies that might allow us to come up with some alternatives. It doesn't have to be this constant back and forth between hunting disguises or ceremonial costumes. Um, so what Chantal did was kind of thinking about what was going on at Starcar more broadly, looking at all the evidence for the butchery of red deer remains, um, all the evidence for skinning and hide working, um, all the evidence for the use of um, red deer bones and antlers in particular to create lots of different kinds of artifacts, including Including, um, sort of hunting tools that might then be involved in the hunting of more red deer um, and she kind of suggests that the star car is this place where um, the kind of people were coming to break down red deer bodies and reassemble them in different ways um, and this kind of area by the water by, by the lake edge as being this kind of space in which the, the the distinctions between red deer and human bodies started to blur as people were consuming red deer venison meat taking that into their own bodies as they were starting to you know make and wear clothing um using red deer furs um you, you know kind of building up their material culture their toolkits using the bones and the, the different different materials that the red deer body um kind of provides uh, and it's within that context that we need to see the kind of wearing of 
of the frontlets um, and the wearing of these kind of headdresses uh, and perhaps this is evidence for uh, an ontology in which um, bodies can be transformed kind of fairly sort of fluidly to between humans and animals um, and if you're transforming your body uh, into that of a red deer um, you could be doing that for either a ritual purpose to communicate with red deer spirits more generally um, and, but you could also be doing that for hunting um, for hunting purposes as well. So if you believed you'd taken on the body of a red deer, um, that might well allow you to get closer to other red deer in the wild um, and hunt them with more success. Um, but that's not a, a kind of a binary between one of those ideas or the other. Um, they can, both of them are possible um, if you think of uh, human bodies as being slightly more fluid and capable of change. So she therefore suggested that um, the red deer headdresses, the red deer frontlets, um, uh, masks and their tools of, of, of corporeal transformation that enable people to transform their bodies into that of red deer um, and back again by removing them um, at the star car. <clears throat> so moving on from 2005, um, picking up the work of uh, Nikki Milner uh, and her colleagues, uh, mostly based at the University of York, but working with folk at UCL, at Chester, at Manchester, at Newcastle at different stages. Um, and in particular, the post glacial project um, excavating at Starcar uh, between 2013 and 2015, um, but also yeah, kind of publishing in the big monographs that came out in 2018. Um, these excavations um, resulted in not only the recovery of more material from Starcar that we can associate with the, the frontlets, with the headdresses, um, 12 um, more finds that were excavated between 2013 and 2015, but also um, a big kind of tranche of experimental research that's kind of primarily led by Amy Little and the setting up of the Year Centre at the University of York, um, but which featured some really, really um, insightful and, in, and, and kind of uh, illuminating experiments uh, based around the production of at the front that so looking at the ways in which you could go about creating the breakage patterns that we see around the red deer skulls which are very kind of specific um, and quite sort of quite kind of repeated across um, all the material that we've seen from the site that we are identifying as as masks or as or as headdresses looking at techniques that involved um, placing a red deer head um, within fire within hot ashes um, covering elements of it in clay uh, to kind of create a differential between um, different areas of bone that then allow it to be uh, broken and flaked down with a, with a hammerstone relatively easy. So you get kind of traces associated with hammerstone damage, whacking with a rock, um, uh, but also you get kind of really nice level edges around the, the bottom of the skull, um, as well as the techniques involved in kind of creating perforations. Um, so really, really informative set of experiments that have helped us to reframe our understanding of these objects. Um, but that kind of sits alongside an appreciation of the variety and the variation in the animals that are being chosen to have this very particular form of treatment applied to them. OK, so um, in Clark's work, he was kind of identifying um, male red deer as being the only animals that are made um, and, and male deer with red deer with antlers intact being the only animals that were made into frontlets. But through our kind of experimentally informed sort of investigations, we were able to see similarities with female red deer skulls, with the skulls of red deer whose antlers have been shed. So all kinds of you know, younger animals, older animals, um, a much more kind of broader spectrum of, of animals that were being treated, uh, whose heads were being treated in this way to produce artifacts like this. Um, and we're also seeing really interestingly, objects that are being abandoned in different stages of the process. Okay, so partially finished frontlets or masks, um, you know, objects that had had the initial stages applied to them, but the process hadn't been seen all the way through. Um, so these experiments are really, really useful in terms of getting to grips with that material and actually kind of fundamentally changing our understanding of what's going on at Starcar in terms of the relationship between um, people and animals. Um, so this kind of allows us to kind of reconsider the star car front a little bit to a certain extent. Because we can start to see that actually the, the process of making these artifacts um, may well as be, uh, well, may, well, may well be as important as the wearing of them was in terms of um, if they are associated with affecting transformations between human and animal bodies. So at Starcar, we see um, what we think are objects that are being made in hearth, so kind of in fireside or, or, or in fire, kind of um, active kind of low burning fires. But they're often deposited, well, they're exclusively deposited into areas of open water, into wetland, um, even if they're in partially finished states. So there's this really interesting kind of people going through the process to part make a frontlet and then depositing them in a very similar way, um, but never them, get, them never getting to a form or a stage where they could have been worn. Um, and so that's really that's really fascinating in terms of why are these objects being grouped and disposed of in a similar way um, when they're not actually capable of wearing. 
Um, and that kind of places a, a focus perhaps on um, the process of making them and what the details of the process of making them. So one of the observations that Amy Little and her team made um, were that in the course of um, heating these red deer heads in the fire, um, you're actually cooking the brain to a, to a certain temperature. Um, and it was a delicacy uh, <laughs> experiment archaeologist leading. He told us that, um, you know, you could kind of slow cooked um, animal brain. You could, as part of the, the manufacturing process, you could remove that and it would be a a kind of food that you wouldn't be you know that would be kind of um sort of associated with with that particular task that particular form of preparation um so there's a kind of a focus on the the sort of the sensory experiences of that that process of making what kinds of things were people doing how are people coming to understand or experience red deer bodies in a different way um, when they're making frontlets or going through the process of making frontlets than they would if they were butchering animals in 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 the, in the more kind of standard sort of sequence that we see elsewhere with the kind of sort of standard removal of the hide and the, the filleting of the flesh and the you know the general sort of disregard of the of the of the skulls and the crania rather than to break open the jaws from marrow um so what's going on you know so what what are the what are the specific aspects of the making a front that um that might be feeding into this process of um transformation or whatever these objects mean um because their kind of ability to function as a mask doesn't seem to dictate um whether or not they're disposed of in a similar way uh, that, that's yeah that's, that's interesting also really interesting that different types of animal um and so it seems to be kind of particular individuals that people are picking up um a particular sex of individual a male or a female um, or a particular biography we have this one individual um, who's kind of sort of top of the cranium was covered in kind of um sort of scars sort of big sort of muscle attachments really obviously he was once a kind of prime um, male stag that had been lots of in, in lots of kind of um rutting battles and it had a kind of grizzled old gnarled stag um so it's kind of really obvious you know we're looking at these these animals that they're they're not all one type of animal they're not all they're not they're not consistently choosing um male red deer of a certain age of a kind of prime age to create these frontlets they're actually picking animals that are at different stages of their lives um, um, different sexes um, and you know does that have an effect on the meaning of the mass that's created um, I don't think it would make a huge difference in the experience of the process of creating the front look but when the object is made it has a different form and therefore is has the potential to evoke different types of meaning and different connotations based on the individual animal we didn't really appreciate that before because some of Chantel's previous work had been looking at maybe kind of categories of red deer um, and the kind of contrast between the animals that are represented in the frontlets as the animals that are generally consumed on the site but this is actually showing that there's much more diversity and it might well be a kind of case-by-case -case basis um in terms of how people are picking uh picking animals to to create these these particular objects um and then there's a uniform deposition in all this variation extent to which they're made as i said before um they're often being deposited in a very kind of similar part of the site very similar environmental conditions kind of shallow open water definitely not places where you could be making these artifacts in situ um if they're being made in in hearths because they're they're underwater at the time in which the objects are, are deposited so this is going to really just going to reframe the way in which we're thinking about frontless a little bit um, to, to kind of consider in more detail process and the process of making as being, you know, if they are involved in transformation of bodies, um, then the process of making is 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 important in that in that transformation. Um, and it might not, it's a transformation that perhaps doesn't start um, when the when the objects are kind of initially worn for a place in the head for the first time. It might be a process that starts earlier on in the in that kind of production. In that kind of production sequence um, and that kind of helps us maybe think about some of the other examples of animal skulls from across the Mesolithic world um, that demonstrate signs of being uh, modified or tampered with but don't make for such kind of compelling cases of um of kind of masks as, as an object that could be worn um so there's material from uh Thatcham in the UK uh as an example of a, a roe deer a roe deer skull at the bottom there uh, that's refitted um which seems to be a kind of recurrent pattern pattern at Thatcham there seems to be um skulls that have been disarticulated um but which are then deposited in in interesting ways that suggest they might have been intended to be re-articulated re in a slightly different configuration so you get um mismatched halves of of, of rodeo frontlets that are, that seem to be deposited together um and you know they can refit across the site but those aren't the pairs that they're deposited in really interesting um the kulamila oryx cranium which is a kind of a, a sort of yeah we're talking kind of middle mesolithic sort of dated um from a from a peat bog in 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 denmark um really characteristic in terms of uh 
top of the skull preserved again lack of the front of uh, the, the nasal bones uh, lack of the jaw lack of the lower cranium um, and like some of the star car um, front it's, it's got this hole that's been created in it so we've been examining that in more detail to try and get a sense of whether that was a perforation that was created intentionally i think it was um it's very very different to the kind of trauma that you see from kind of pole axing sort of um slaughter patterns that you see on a lot of the other um kind of early early cattle and and, and oryx skulls um in, in in southern scandinavia really really clean really really clean edges uh, and looks like it has been created with a with a flint tool rather than a, a blunt core stone tool um, but how do you make sense of that? You know, it's clearly far too big to have been worn on someone's head. It's sort of, you know, kind of a meter across. It's a really chunky, chunky skull. Um, but again, it's perhaps showing this attention to the treatment of skulls um, over a prolonged period of time um, that, that has echoes in terms of the way in which the, the star car frontlets are being made. Um, the Seventioli, um, Seventioli um, seal skulls from Lithuania, again, quite ambiguous, a little bit later on in the Mesolithic. Um, but again, we've got evidence for the treatment of um, the, the processing of seal skulls in quite unusual ways. Um, so they've got evidence for kind of hide polish and plant polish building up along these along these objects. Um, are these potentially things that are being um, developed into kind of composite artifacts? Perhaps they're I think the arguments for them being worn directly on the head are kind of um, are kind of less convincing. But if we're taking this broader approach to the kind of the, this kind of persistence in in attention to treatments of animal skulls, um, maybe this is part of the same pattern. Um, and worth bearing in mind that we know from the anthropology that objects that get thought of as masks don't necessarily ever have to have been worn. And then some of the classic examples like Bad Durenberg from Germany, um, are slightly later than Starcar, um, but this example of a roe deer front look that was um, found in association with the skull of a, of a woman who'd been buried um, has been suggested to be evidence of a headdress. And then right at the end of the Mesolithic, um, at sites like Tivoli in Belgium, um, again, the kind of the processing and the curation, really interesting curation of um, elements of red deer skulls uh, of frontal bones um, worked by the David and colleagues looking at this site in Belgium and, and throwing up some really interesting questions. So there is this kind of, does seem to be this kind of persistence right across Northern Europe, um, even if the actual form of, of, you know, the kind of star car front that seems to be a quite a short lived thing in terms of the early Mesolithic, there is a persistence in this sort of interest in um, heads and the processing and treatment of heads um, in slightly different ways to kind of more conventional butchery uh, practices um, that, that, that could, does sort of stick out and, and, and does kind of merit sort of further consideration. And, and uh, it's kind of getting us to think that that is this process of, of transformation, the kind of something that is kind of more, more broadly spread across Europe, maybe sort of a deeply sort of historicized ontology. So um, people that have the power to change bodies or, or people have the, have the capacity to change their, their bodies that are slightly more fluid than we might think of today. Um, but that, that the, the specifics and the details of those belief systems change through space and time. So different species become the kind of the focus for those transformations. Um, at Starcar, it seems to be red deer. Um, maybe at other sites at later dates, it becomes roe deer. Um, maybe in areas of Lithuania in the Baltic, it becomes seals. You know, that you can see kind of there's scope there for, for, for cultural variation across the Mesolithic world um, through time. But what's really interesting is that that treatment of heads, that treatment of crania seems to remain key throughout the throughout the sequence and is the recurring theme. Um, but the, the, you know, within that, um, sometimes in places, masks as artifacts are that kind of catalyst that allow that transformation. But other times and places, um, they play a lesser role and they're more kind of maybe a, a product of that production, but not necessarily of, of, of those treatments, but, but not necessarily the key thing that's required for affecting those transformations. Okay, and this is very much a work in progress and the, the, the kind of work continues apace to, to write this up and publish this, but hopefully um, I've given you a sense of, of, of some of the potential really for thinking about masks, some of the evidence that has been mooted in the past, why masks are a kind of a, a, a tricky subject to get to grips with, um, but also why they are so potentially interesting um, in terms of the, 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 the stories they might be able to tell us about kind of European prehistory. Um, and this is a kind of a, a demonstration of the approach that we've been sort of taking and advocating. Um, and we're looking to develop that further um, through the course of the summer and hopefully um, publishing a book on that in the in the not too distant future. Um, as I say, it's been a project that's been really, really fun to be involved with, worked with great colleagues um, and had an opportunity to do all sorts of really interesting thinking and reading when it comes to um, anthropology and kind of critical approaches to ontology. Um, 
but it's been sort of heavily disrupted by by COVID and so is kind of is, is sort of bubbling along and is getting there slowly um but didn't yeah maybe not as as quickly as we first envisioned but I'm enjoying it so I'll just uh finish there and say thank you brilliant thank you Ben that's excellent um we've only got a minute or two, two or three minutes um for any um questions or comments that people want I'm just trying to get chat to come up um I don't know what my computer's doing now. Um, Martin, I think the slide after you asked the question of define ontology in your context was actually answered. But do you want to unmute and, and make any comment to Ben? That was my, Martin Burley. Or if anyone else would like to type a message before I, or a question before I thank Ben very much. Um, can I just ask you, um, does the Yorkshire Museum hold um, any of the artefacts from Starcar? Yes, it does. It holds lots of artefacts from Starcar. So the um, the, the post-glacial project um, archive from Starcar has been deposited with the with the Yorkshire Museum. Um, so that's all the stuff that was excavated from 2013 to 2015 um, is now at the Yorkshire Museum. And I think we, we also accessed some of the stuff that was excavated from the site in the 80s as well. So there's... Um, yeah, there's 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 quite a lot of material now in the in the Yorkshire Museum. Uh, well, that's interesting because I was just talking to um, someone from there yesterday who said that's going to be one of their future exhibitions. Yeah, it was a big, um, and again, Nikki's a person who needs to talk about this because it was really um, something she was very keen on is to keep the the Yorkshire Museum involved because the yeah, the original excavations that run through Cambridge University the the assemblage ended up getting sort of divvied up and distributed to lots of you know you, you could see the, the Cambridge politics depositing different things in different collections and and that made that has made researching the the entire assemblage really difficult and Nikki was really keen not to not to make that mistake again and and to, that the Yorkshire Museum would be a very um natural home for the stark art material yeah of course sort of stay in Yorkshire yeah um right Terry O'Connor's uh, put makeup very fugitive in archaeology, but do you think it's continuous with masks? That's a great question, um, Terry. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's something we'll have to get into in more detail when we start to get to the nitty gritty of exactly what those depictions are. You know, kind of thinking about where there's stuff that could be um, depicted by makeup and not. I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, yeah, it is interesting when you when you when you look at the evidence for pigmentation and um, there's clearly the capacity to create, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of talk about tattooing, um, but temporary stuff like makeup isn't isn't something that's discussed with the same levels of levels of detail. Um, yeah, so it's 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 absolutely something to consider very hard to find definitive evidence for. But as you've seen today, there's, um, you know, it's the, the, the trick with this stuff is that it's very hard to find definitive evidence for. And it's about constructing the most robust argument you can. Um, but, but, you know, the smoking gun might be elusive. And, and Nikki's just sent through a message in answer to my question, really, uh, that some of the frontlets from Star Car are currently on display in the Yorkshire Museum. If people would like to go and look at them and the museum is planning another exhibition. So um, I think that was going to be next year from what I heard yesterday, but obviously we'll be telling people about that. Um, do we have one more question before I thank Ben very much for doing this fabulous presentation for us? Maybe, maybe not. So I'm just going to pause recording or stop recording.